Welcome to Successful Parenting, where we, Jackie Rue and Robin Choquette, share practical skills for families to build resilience and healthy connections. As practicing professionals and parents ourselves, we hope this podcast is a resource for parents to grow, reflect, and learn more about themselves and their children. Our approach is simple, tangible, and most importantly, we lead with compassion for the integrity of the families we serve. This podcast should not be taken as medical advice and is intended for informational purposes only. We love our work and we can't wait to watch families gain confidence and open themselves up to new ways of successful parenting. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, Jackie. I am super excited about our topic today. And I know you and I have talked a lot about this topic. Yes. Be an easy topic, but as we know, it's not, it's interesting, just the whole nutrition. And I think it throws people off. And sometimes when I mention it in sessions, people are like, oh, (laughs) I don't don't want to talk about it. It is so important in the way it impacts our emotional and mental health. Yes. I had one client that was telling me a story, had gone to a doctor, had taken their daughter with them and was frustrated, you know, after they had taken the weight and said, you know, I'm trying, but I feel like I'm not getting anywhere. And the nurse quickly turned and said, oh, I just lost so much weight, told how much weight, you know, I did this and this and this. And it was interesting because the client said that the nurse walked out and the daughter turned around and said, do not listen. That's a 30, I doubt if he's 40 year old man. And he's telling you in your in your upper 50s of how he lost weight, your body is completely different and that he's getting caught in to you're talking about your health and where your health is, which is included that piece. And even I think sometimes in the medical field, it can be so shaming because she said she walked away and she felt shamed at first, but because of what her daughter said, it kind of stopped her to go, oh, because he was making it sound simple. And that's what you're saying, Jackie. It's not as simple sometimes. It's not always, it can be hard. So I agree. And I think our families need to be able to find a resource for this. And I love us having this conversation today. Well, and the other thing I think we're going to touch on is I had a relative that had lost some weight. When she lost weight, she got so many comments, even from our own family of you look so good. You look so great. What are you doing? You look amazing. And it made me realize what a tie there is for people to hear that, especially young people and with social media and all of the, you need to be a certain way, you need to look a certain way. And I think we're in the midst of a culture right now that is looking for maybe quicker fixes. And even likewise, sometimes people will make comments, well, why do you need to worry about nutrition? You don't have a weight issue. Like it It fuels us. I think there's a lot of misunderstandings that if you don't have a quote weight issue, then you should just be eating hot dogs all day because you can. Nutrition is not so much really about always just weight either. And so the way I was raised, I mean, I remember, you know, I was taught by my mom to just not eat. You know, she would say, you know, girls should just, you know, not eat. You know, I remember one time me and my friends in high school drank Diet Coke for three days and that's it. Wow. And we thought we were going to lose weight. And then at the end of the three days, we like ate everything under the sun and gained like an extra 10 pounds. It was in the midst of, I think when I was in high school, the culture of do whatever you can. It was when the, like the, all the new diet supplements came out and I think everybody was just picking any fad diet. And so I think there's so many misunderstandings that we've been kind of raised in this culture that I think these conversations need to happen more often. Right. And I think families don't know how to talk to children about nutrition and talk about fueling your body. It's how you talk about it. I'll share, I have a family member has really worked on making some changes. And it's amazing when people talk to me about it, they're always asking, how much weight have they dropped? Are they afraid they're going to gain the weight back? And I keep trying Mm -hmm. to shift these conversations. It's not about their weight. And I don't know, because I've never asked them. I don't ask about the numbers. Mm -hmm. I ask about how are you doing? Mm -hmm. What does this feel like for you? All of that stuff. So it is pretty amazing, but I think it's hard. It's a hard conversation. I don't think we always, very many of us had parents that really were healthy and modeling this for us. So, Well, and even in the last thing I'll say before introduction is even a lot of times kids tell me, you know, my parents talk about needing to lose weight or my parents talk about not liking their body or my parents talk about needing to go exercise because they just ate a cupcake and kids are listening and watching. If you're concerned about a child's weight, making comments about their eating habits is probably not the best way to go. Right. 
So those are just things that we're going to touch on today. You know, as we were talking about bringing in an expert on this conversation, we thought about bringing in Katie Primack, who is a dietitian who has worked in hospitals and, you know, private practice settings. And she really tackles uh, nutrition from emotional and mental health stance. She works with a lot of therapists and not just on eating disorders, disordered eating, but all of the above. She works with children all the way through adults. It's interesting as the more she works with families, the more we see that it really does impact their emotional and mental health in the right way. Welcome, Katie. I'm so glad you are here today. Thank you very much. Welcome, Katie. We are happy to have you on with us. Yes, thank you. It's a pleasure. I'm looking forward to it. It's such an important discussion. So I'm really glad to be here today. Thank you. Well, I want to jump in and ask the first question you know, how can we help parents kind of what we're talking about, you know, to have these healthy relationships with food? How can we help our children to have a different relationship than I think a lot of us did growing up? Absolutely. I think, and you guys touched on it a little before, just the discussion piece, try to focus on being healthy and not dieting. The word diet, dieting can create such a restrictive mindset, becoming deficient in different nutrients And we eliminate food groups, which really have an impact on our mental and emotional states and our physical development as children are growing and developing and restricting their intake can be really detrimental to both their growth and development. So I think honestly, focusing on just balanced meals, you know, three balanced meals. And what does balance really mean? It means (laughs) avoid skipping meals, which can actually almost cause overeating or binging later in the day. If there's skipped meals, kind of allowing metabolism to work by eating consistently throughout the day and revving up energy and also helps regulate your mood, keeps your blood sugar stable throughout the day. So a lot of positives from eating consistently throughout your day. What does balance actually means? It's incorporating all the food groups that are going to help feed and fuel the brain and give your body energy so you feel your best. You know, my mother, she had this color thing is that you had to have different colors on your plate. Does that make any sense? And do you think that helps? Okay. Yeah, I think it's how it looks on the plate when we think about the colors of the rainbow. We think about all the antioxidant it provides the body. The colors kind of allow for when we talk about variety and moderation getting the fruits and vegetables, the fiber, those carbohydrates, and then the protein. It helps balance the plate and makes it look not only pretty, but it also provides all those nutrients that we may be lacking when we have less color on our plate. Okay. So mom did that right. She did. Yes, yes, definitely. Helps the immune system. Yeah. Wonderful. They always say color your plate with like a rainbow. Okay. You know, Robin, I think we had lots of colors too, because our meals came in boxes. (laughs) 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 They would take them out of the box and... (laughs) Oh, really? Oh, no. A lot of times. They were pretty excited. I think that's about the time the TV dinners really started. TV dinners. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, they love those things. They were like, wow, this is great. Yeah. You and I have talked about intuitive eating, and I know that can be a hard one. I mean, for whatever reason, and Robin and I have laughed about this, that we like believe we have to finish our our plates, (laughs) but uh, we used to laugh. For whatever reason, we were also quick. I'm a quick eater, and I think it comes from working in the hospital and and working in just different fast-paced settings that- you know, one of the things we've really done is learn to like slow down and you don't have to eat everything on your plate. But when you think about intuitive eating, it is a challenge because so often find whatever pattern my body's in with food is kind of what the body then, it's almost like the cue signs adapt to it. And like when we've had you know clients in the eating disorder programs, you know, they will say they're not hungry because you know, they're used to not eating as much. And so what is intuitive eating really? And and how do we start to move more in that direction? Absolutely. Intuitive eating focuses on that physical piece of hunger, which is the the need and requirement to fuel your body. So when we're physically hungry, our body should signal us that it's time to have some more fuel or it's time to eat. And then typically the stopping point would be when you've had enough fuel and you're comfortably full. And having an awareness of this allows us to separate the physical from the emotional reasons why we eat. Of course, over the summer, schedules are a little less structured without school for kids. So sleep patterns change can affect their hunger cues and fullness cues. So kind of disrupting that pattern can cause overeating or boredom eating, eating when they're not hungry, 
being in tune to what their body actually needs in terms of fueling for the day. I mean, it also encourages mindfulness. So we talked about the speed and the, the pace of your eating. It takes about 20 minutes to regulate fullness. So that 20 minutes, the slowing up down of what you're eating allows the digestion and allows your body to really sense what fullness means. And our intake would almost be less when we're eating and stopping when we're full, giving us a comfortable fullness. So again, we're not feeling overly stuffed when we eat too fast. We get to the point where we realize, man, I feel really overly full and Mm -hmm. then we feel uncomfortable. So slowing down can just help us not only helps with digestion, but just get those really accurate cues for fullness when to stop. Well, it's interesting. And and I do something that probably I don't even know why I do it. But like if I'm working, if I know I'm not going to be able to eat, let's say between 12 and five, right? So then I find myself a lot of times I feel like overcompensating and eating almost like two meals in one. Because with digestion, it sounds like it doesn't work like that. Like I almost view it sometimes as you're putting stuff in the bank. I think eating more consistently and like spreading it out through the day not only helps increase metabolism, but also regulates and increases your energy. So I think I I hear what you're that Mm -hmm. like wanting to put it in a bank. Your body will use it, but your body will readily use it. And it's more available if it's more consistent throughout your day. Now, we don't always have access to that because, like you said, your schedule doesn't allow for snacks sometimes or full meals. It's just planning ahead and being more prepared with foods that are going to be more satisfying and more filling when you do have that adequate time to eat. Yeah. You know, everyone's body is different when they're a child and an adolescent and a teen. And and so often we see that they do try to skip meals, especially around, you know, sports and things like that. And so I think this reminder of intuitive eating and teaching kids about kind of what our body needs and the impact when you're not eating and what that has. Absolutely. And I think going from a pattern of skipping meals really throws off your hunger cues to be able to actually listen to them. So eating consistently and having structure or having a schedule of eating through for the Day, kind of planning out what it would look like, not necessarily even what you're going to have, but kind of like mapping out times for the day of when you're going to be eating or snacks. When you when will you have a time for a snack? Well, not only allow for your metabolism to increase, but it'll allow you to be able to have those structured hunger cues. So they're almost predictable, you know, and, and I think a school year helps do that because we typically eat breakfast before school starts and then school will, you know, advocate by having a lunch break. But I think the summer really throws that off when we're sleeping in or when we don't have a structure or a schedule for the day. Right. I totally see that. You know, as you're talking, I had to laugh earlier because Jack and I, we do eat so fast. <laughs> we would go at the hospital, we'd go in and whip that food down and move on. And, and it was just, it made me laugh because I still struggle with that. I think it's hard in this society. We live very fast paced lives and yes. I think we're all very, also very distracted. Mm-hmm. And so I think sometimes just taking a couple moments, we don't always have the 20 to 30 minutes to be able to slow down. I think it's just paying attention to what our body's telling us and just being more mindful overall, I think can be a helpful tool, even if you don't have the adequate time to sit there, but just paying attention to what your body's saying. Am I hungry now? Am I full around that halfway mark? How am I feeling right now? Mm -hmm. So just paying attention to that. I will eat with my left hand and use the utensil in my left hand to slow myself down. So that's a little trick I've kind of tried to incorporate when I know, especially when I'm feeling that energy and I'm moving right on, I know I won't slow down. Well, I think one of the things that we often hear, and we hear parents say this to kids is, don't eat that. That's not good for you. That's not something that's good. And we get into this good and bad kind of place. What do you think about labeling? Can you tell us a little bit about your recommendations around food discussions in that way? Absolutely. We desperately want to avoid labeling food as either bad or good or healthy or unhealthy. I think all foods play a role in overall nutrition and healthy eating. Sometimes labeling foods as good or bad, it's a risky practice and it can be linked to the development of eating disorders, especially in adolescence when we're, we're putting judgment on categorizing food. I think a healthy approach is to kind of teach children to distinguish the properties that it provides our bodies. More so, like an example would be looking at foods as the color, like you said, the color on the plate, the antioxidants that it provides, or thinking about milk as providing calcium. So instead of shying away from just good or bad, looking at foods and how it can provide us different nutrients and how it will value our bodies and make us feel better. When it comes to unhealthy foods, the dialogue can focus on helping children recognize 
how their bodies feel after consuming them. Are they hyperactive? Are they fidgety? Are they tired? Are they feeling sluggish? So instead of using those terms, it's just more how these foods make our bodies feel. I like that. Once again, that's that mindfulness. Yes. I want to be able to teach kids that it's, everything is good in moderation. And what does moderation really look like? It's having balanced plate. It's paying attention to how we feel when we eat something. Are we full? You know, are we eating that? Are we, did we not eat enough for breakfast? That's why we're being more mindless when we're snacking. So it's paying attention to more of that, those different cues. It's interesting. I know, at least for me and Robin, probably too, we were brought up on the calories. Well, everything's mm-hmm. about the calories, right? traveling like outside of the US. I've been served meals before and I'm like, wait a minute, where's the rest of the food? (laughs) But it's interesting traveling sometimes to different places that they do consider our portions to be pretty large. And so it does get confusing sometimes when you think about being mindful and, you know, how to choose and how much to choose. I mean, do you have any recommendations for that? When I think about calories, I think of it's just trying to teach, especially adolescents and children, that it's just a unit of energy. It's not something to avoid or fear or be afraid of. It's not even something that we have to be counting or calculating. It's more just that's how much energy the foods provide us. And I think you're right. I think portions sometimes tend to be on the larger side, which go beyond what our bodies actually need. And I think what can be helpful is all the things we're talking about, being mindful, slowing down when you eat, stopping when you're full. When you're eating consistently throughout the day, you're able to kind of help regulate better portion control, right? It doesn't mean you're measuring foods or anything like that. But if you're not skipping meals, you're going to have better portion control and be more mindful. So you're not going into a meal ravenous where you feel out of control and unable to stop. Or by the time you stop, you're overly full and very uncomfortable. So I think getting a good rhythm with your eating throughout the day, planning ahead can be really helpful, preparing foods and Focusing on foods that are going to fill us up a little bit more, the proteins, the fibers, of course, the fruits and vegetables that are going to allow for fullness and the dietary fats as well. So we're eating that consistent balance throughout our day. Yeah, I like that too. And I really do think as parents, we model for our kids about food and, you know, we kind of set the expectations you know, just thinking about ways to get our children involved and making it fun, making the kitchen a happy place. What are some fun ways to get our children involved? What have you found to really work? Yeah. And I think, you know, to touch on that too, just the discussion about fueling your body, you don't have to use those terms going back to the calories, just how can we give our body that energy? So understanding what portion sizes sometimes look like, teaching the balance, maybe kind of being a good example at home of what a balanced plate might look like so they can learn from you as well as not from society and what portions are actually looking like. Eating at home, home home-cooked meals, we're going to have better regulation with portion control than eating out. Portions tend to be really big and a lot more than our body needs when we're eating in restaurants. And so we have a better way to promote balance and moderation and portion control when we're cooking more at home. And I think during summer break, it's easier to spend time eating together without the rush of the school year. So I'd really encourage parents and families to take advantage of the flexibility of schedules to sit down at the table with your child and try to eat better together as a family. Sometimes that can be very helpful with slowing down and having conversation and being less distracted at meals. And I think just maintaining a daily routine is probably one of the number one things. You know, a mealtime, breakfast, lunch, dinner with a snack here or there, really focusing on when you're physically hungry and just looking for foods that are really going to enhance both energy and your fullness. So like we said, protein, produce, fiber, those complex carbohydrates, the dietary fats that really help with feeling satisfied after you're done eating. Again, enhancing that balanced plate. What does it look like? If it looked like a peace sign, we'd have our protein, we'd have our grains, we'd have the dietary dietary fats, and then we would always enhance it with fruits or vegetables. So truly trying to emulate that um, and be good examples as parents without the discussion on the negativity of it. It's just fueling our body each day. Okay. Can you give us a little bit about some ways to, you know, really manage that mindless eating and, and ways that we as parents can model? Absolutely. Mindless eating is usually due to different external reasons, emotions, or boredom, or sometimes even a habit. And I think eating without a normal schedule or being unstructured will often create some mindlessness and can lead to overeating or binging. So having a specific meal time and designated snack time can be really helpful. Like, hey, you know what? We're going to have snack around three o'clock, and this is the time that we're going to have that. Now, it doesn't always line up with hunger cues initially, but if you get a good structured eating plan throughout your day, you're hunger cues are going to follow suit. So it won't take more than a few days for your body to adapt to that. This will help cut down mindless eating. And summer can be 
where kids are sleeping in. And so we're really wanting to try to keep meal and snack times as regular as possible. So it just minimizes that mindlessness. Well, thank you, Katie. This conversation is great. Don't you think so, Jackie? I absolutely love it. I do. And I think there's so much to this topic because I see the way it impacts our children in terms of their confidence and overall their performance in school, You know, their performance academically, their performance in sports. So often parents say, how do we get our children more engaged? How do we get our children more motivated? How do we get them to behave? And I do think along with like sleep and hygiene and all those other things, nutrition is at the forefront. We're going to continue this conversation. And I'm really excited to even touch on ways that it impacts our children's overall emotional health and confidence and body image in the next episode. Absolutely. Thank you everyone for listening. And Katie, Jackie, and I will be back next week to finish up this conversation. Have a great one, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you for joining us and make sure to subscribe and like us to catch our next episode where we will take you on a journey to find new ways of successful parenting.